Buongiorno, eh, signore e signore, eh, grazie mille. <ride> eh, non parlo italiano molto bene. Uh, so I promise I will speak very slowly in English. So hunting hypermetria, a displaced Bennett. Known to be one of the earliest surviving plays from ancient Greece, since it was almost certainly performed in 463 BC, Isthmus' tragedy, Supplicants, is the only complete play from a trilogy, perhaps tautology, that featured the Dunnard myth. Isthmus' version of the story remains incomplete, with, in my view, the first and final plays only providing a handful of fragments suggesting what action may have taken place. Additionally, a lack of plot summary survives. However, the stories of the sisters that were forced to marry their cousins and subsequently murder them on their wedding night has influenced many retellings throughout the classical world and beyond. Many of these versions have a strong focus on one female character, usually named Hypermesha. However, she does not appear in the extant material for Aeschylus' tragic trilogy. In this paper, I will go hunting for Hypermesha. Firstly, I will investigate the likelihood of whether this character did appear in Aeschylus' trilogy through examining the extant evidence and how other ancient writers approach the myth. I will then look at the role of Hypermesha in notable perceptions of the myth from recent years and finally offer my interpretation of how Hypermesha may have appeared in Aeschylus' work. Before we address Hypermesha, let us look at the myth itself. Ancient myths are often fluid entities. There is a skeleton structure to the story, however details or focuses will change from version to version over time. When it comes to the Dunham myth, we have a number of ancient sources who have made reference to the plot, and from this we can identify four integral and coherent elements that tend to appear. The first three are, the myth commences with two brothers who are the descendants of Io. One man, Danis, has 50 daughters, and the other, Egyptus, has 50 sons. Number two, the brothers argue over who holds power over their land. Number three, the 50 sons are set to marry their cousins, the 50 daughters. Danis commands that the girls kill their husbands on their wedding night. Eastless of supplicants only deals with a small section of the plot outline, focusing on the outrage of the forced marriages and attempts to escape male cousins. Therefore, I believe I can, we can expect that the other two tragedies of Aeschylus would have focused on other elements that I have just outlined. For the purpose of this paper, I will put aside discussions and speculation of what may have taken place in the first two plays and focus on what I consider the final play, Dennis, which is referenced in hypothesis Pioxy 2256 fragment 3. The final element that is prevalent in the various ancient sources is what we're most interested for this paper. All the daughters obey their father apart from one who spares her husband. This is our ca character, Hypermeshna. Perhaps sometimes she is referenced by name, sometimes she is nameless, but her actions are still there. In supplicants, none of the women are named individually. They work as a collective, with the individual focus on their father and the other men in the play. We also do not have any surviving cast list for the trilogy that could prove that Hypermesha did appear. However, she is a popular trope in other works. It may be more beneficial for us to look at other versions of the story. For the myth in Aeschylus' Stenner trilogy has been retold by many classical authors and poets. To start, let us look at the presence of another Greek tragedy, the play of the is Bound, attributed in antiquity to Aeschylus, but more likely to have been written by an unknown playwright, features a speech where the outline of the Danis fate is provided a prophecy to Io, the ancestress, by the demigod Prometheus. The character of Hypermestra and her actions make an appearance in these final lines. However, she is not openly named. The reasoning for her sparing is stated due to being charmed by desire, emphasizing a sense of infatuation with her husband rather than an intense or sexual knowing. The myth was also retold in poetry from the great hero of the world. 
The Greek lyric poet Pindar chose to provide a version of the Dallas story as the focus of one of his Pythian odes. Within this 125 line poem, he mentions the woman, but not the deed that they committed. This is an interesting retelling of the story because he claims that there are only 48 daughters, which goes against the common trope of 50. It also omits any reference to the other common component, the murder of her husbands, and in fact indicates it seemed to be an amicable process of obtaining suitors for the daughters. In this poem, there is no need for the high pressure character, which makes us question whether she is a later addition, particularly when we know this ode was written in 474 BC and predates Aeschylus' Dunne trilogy. Did Aeschylus lean heavily on this interpretation of myth? and therefore have no need for hypnosia? I would think not, given the events of the XM play supplicants. In, order, in particular, the outrage and animosity that Danos and his daughters allude to in their dialogue about potential suitors. Perhaps then did Aeschylus evoke a version that is similar to what future mythographers describe. Notable versions of this plot are provided by ancient mytholog mythologists, mythologists, mythologists Apollodorus and Hyginus. The Greek collector of myths, Apollodorus, introduces us to Hypermestro, who is claimed to be the oldest of the daughters and betrothed to Lysimius, who is um, the male cousin who is usually identified as um, her betrothed and the husband that is spared. He goes on to explain her actions and her, the repercussions. Here the emphasis is on the reasoning of the sparing is because Lysimius did not have sex or force himself upon her. Apollodorus also gives a happy ending to this version of the story, claiming that Danius was moved to reunite Hypnesia with Lysimius after the intervention of the gods. The Roman mythographer Hyginus reports the story too, and states that Hypnesia, after being ordered by her father to kill her husband, spared Lysimius, and as a consequence, a shrine was erected to the couple, with the murderous sisters being condemned to pour water into a pot full of holes in the underworld. This version of the story is supported by Ovid in the Metamorphoses, <coughs> where he states that the girls who plotted the destruction of their cousins were doomed incessantly to fetch the water that they had lost. In Pausanias' description of Greece, there is a nod to the Dunnard story, with the writer describing wooden idols that had been dedicated to Aphrodite by Hypermesha herself, in thanks for being eventually acquitted by the archives when she was put on trial by Danius for not joining in the murder and letting her husband live. The first known time that we hear Hypermesha's voice is through the Roman poet, Ovid, who was well versed in his Greek tragedy. He chose his Herodotus to use Hypermesha's voice in the form of a letter to Lysimus to retell how the murders occurred and to inform him of her situation. We get a sense of strength from the character of Hypermesha standing up to her family in the Greek interpretations, but here she goes from being courageous to almost fragile, claiming that she was unable to carry out the act, however has a sense of piety towards her husband. At the end of the letter she pleads for Lysimus' assistance, which does not appear in earlier versions of the mythic plot. Despite being from Roman audience, it is clearly an excessive dramatisation of Hypermesha's story. This emotive and vivid narrative provides some insight into the foundations of Hypermesha's characterisation that Aeschylus may have employed. Horace, another Roman poet, also used the Danids within his odes. In a lesson for light, he does not name Hypermesha, but describes a girl who won everlasting fame for sparing her husband and uses her voice to demonstrate how honourable she was. And the quote is, I am more soft-hearted than others. I shall not strike you down or keep you under lock and key. As for me, my father can, if he wants to, load me down with cruel chains for sparing my poor husband out of piety. And then she goes on to say, Go, and good luck to you, and carve my tomb a sad epitaph in my memory. Both Roman poets are determined to emphasize the sense of duty Hypermesha had to her husband over her treacherous blood relatives. The reason for why Hypermesha ignored her father's orders to kill varies from interpretation to interpretation. Apollodorus and Horace simply imply that Hypermesha disobeyed her father's command because Lysimius was respectful of her on their wedding night and did not remove her 
opportunity or take advantage of her. Whereas in the prophecy in Prometheus Bound, it's just that it's not sex related and that she just grown fond of her husband. Ovid seems to be the only one to suggest that she was too scared and too virtuous to carry out the act. Ultimately, Hymenestra is depicted as turning her back on her family to do what she believes is right. As we bear these, these versions in mind, we start to question the role and appearance of Hymenestra in the final tragedy of Aeschylus' trilogy. This becomes more pertinent when we look at the excerpt material for the play, in particularly one fragment linked to the Danids. <coughs> this fragment, quoted in Athenaeus de Nafsai, attributes a speech to Aphrodite, who it could be inferred must have been one of the characters in the fragment of the play. But Athenaeus does not specify where the dialogue is placed in the action. Where in the play, where in the play is this fragment located? Many scholars believe that there had been a key moment where a trial would have taken place in this final installment of the trilogy. This would echo the legalistic action in uh, the Mendes, the third trilogy, tragedy of the only extant trilogy of Aeschylus, the Oristion. There is certainly a good thematic link between the two trilogies, both showcasing females killing their husband and the aftermath. In the case of the Oristion, focusing on the Hydromestion plot and the execution of the murder of Agamemnon. If we look to the Mendes as a template, then a trial would have taken place to bring the tragedy of uh, the Danids to a dramatic close. In Eumenides, we see the intervention of two gods. Athena calls for the trial to take place, and Apollo acts as counsel for Orestes. In, if these were sometimes repeated a similar formula, that would mean a similar scene would have taken place in the Danids. Perhaps Aphrodite spoke in defense of Hypernestra. It is likely that Hypermesha appeared in Aeschylus' version since she's such a common factor in the retellings, but scholarship differs on her role and what took place in the final scene. If a trial did take place, some scholarship suggests that the Argives may have supported Danius' place against his daughter, perhaps not knowing all the details. Therefore, Hypermesha would require the intervention of a goddess, such as Aphrodite, to achieve an acquittal. The versions of the Danid story by Polydorus and Ovid indicate that an outraged Danius probably would have tried to punish his daughter for her betrayal. On the other hand, scholars believe there may have been potentially two trials, one for Hypnestra and one for the rest of the girls. An alternative view of the trial scene would be that of fact of the trial of the other 49 Danids and that Aphrodite undertook the role of prosecutor. Surely they should have escaped judgment of the acts they have committed, nor should their father. Despite all the discussion of the trial, we have no formal evidence for any taking place, and it's important to bear in mind that all scholarship about a trial, in good line, is pure conjecture. We appeal to the tradition of such a trial taking place in Argos, since Paul makes reference to one, but this does not prove that the tradition was used by Aeschylus in this trilogy. Putting aside the ancient interpretations of Hypermesha, perhaps a role in contemporary added date limitations to the myth may give us additional ideas to work with. In 1995, Silvio Percoretti started a work on an epic version of the whole Danish trilogy, Le Danaires, which toured internationally from the Avion Theatre Festival in France to the Lincoln Centre in the USA. Rather than transform the language into a contemporary idiom, familiar to a modern audience in favour that is favoured by many playwrights today, Percoretti kept what he believes is the dramatic tone of Aeschylus' tragedy. He condensed the three tragedies and one Saturday play, Amimoni, into a single production. The main section of Percoretti's production features lines from the surviving play and supplicants, but the rest of the action is scripted by Percoretti and includes the lines from Aeschylus' other plays. Perhaps through this, he could have obtained Aeschylus' voice and perhaps the version of events somehow. We do not know. Percoretti's plot aligns itself with the view of the scholars who believe that Supplicants is the first play in the tragic trilogy, followed by the Egyptians and concludes with the Danids. During the first part of the play, the audience are introduced to the 50 girls in a similar fashion to what takes place in the Supplicants. 
They are a collective, not individuals. We, can, we do not make out any difference between each actress. If you can see in the first photo, you can see that the ladies are in blue and there is no distinguishing features of the ladies in blue. They are a singular identity. Once, known, once the known action from the supplicants is completed, a character explicitly said in the script to be Alimone, the character of Gold and Santa Fe, goes off to look for water. This is Percoretta's first indication of an individual action amongst the girls. They return to being collected in preparation for their wedding night, adorning themselves with white wedding dresses that then become tents when the Egyptians arrive. Each couple enters their own tent, all apart from Hypernestra, who is waiting for Sinius' arrival. She is not named on stage, has some specifically identified in script. She questions the forthcoming deeds of her sisters and queries her involvement. On Mycenaeus' arrival, Hypermestra is so worried about carrying out the murder that she's unable to look at him. They talk and become fond of each other, in a similar vein to which has been outlined in other versions of the myth. The Danes exit their tents, revealing the bodies of their slain husbands to the audience and Mycenaeus. Realising that he has escaped his fate due to Hypermestra, the 49 other Danes ch chase him. The gods then take control of the scene and drive the girls crazy in the dance of torture. They are repeatedly punished, while Hypermeshna, who is spared, witnesses their ordeal. Perperetti creates his version of the Danid myth from a melting pot of various versions I've mentioned earlier in this paper. Hypermeshna has a role in the abduction, but does not become the memorable character that I would expect. If Perperetti chooses to transform, in fact, Perperetti chooses to transform Hypermeshna into Hypermeshna towards the end of the play, as demonstrated in this picture up here. Both Hypermeshna and Hypermeshna are given distinct roles away from the collective, by how, however, by sharing the spotlight, their roles appear to lessen, particularly in the role of Hypermeshna. In complete contrast, Charles Mead's adaptation of the Dana trilogy, Big Love, premiered at the Actors Theatre of Louisville, USA in 2000. Like Percoretti, Charles Mee has been fascinated with ancient texts for most of his life. It is interesting to see that instead of recreating the fragmented Dana trilogy, a drawn out or a drawn out tetralogy, like Percoretti, he opts to create one single production stage in the myth. While Percoretti's drama seems to follow the action that many scholars and writers hypothesize for this Business trilogy, Mee names, changes the names and locations and deletes characters. The script largely ignores what's taking place in the Egyptians, for example, no war takes place, and jumps to the action and takes part in the final text of the trilogy with the murders and repercussions. In order to illustrate the differences, I will now outline the plot of the love. The play opens on a woman undoing her wedding dress, entering a bathtub and attempting to relax. She's interrupted by a man who questions her presence there. We soon learn that this, is, this woman, named Lydia, has fled from Greece to Italy with her 49 assistants in order to escape an arranged marriage with their first cousins who are of Greek and American heritage. This is our hypermeshing character. She asks for asylum from the man whose justice his uncle, the owner of the house, may be able to help. The audience is then introduced to Olympia and Priona, two representations of the 49 sisters. There are not 50 women on stage. <laughs> the next part follows the rough outline of these sisters' supplicants, with the women negotiating their refuge. Once an agreement takes place, Nikos, our Lysinius in this adaptation, enters and apologizes, apologizes to Lydia for his brother's behavior. They find themselves alone, and Nikos admits that he's in love with Lydia. They start to become com comfortable in each other's company and then begin to kiss. But this scares Lydia and she runs off. So we're already seeing the reasoning being set for why the high minister character does not want to take part in the murders this way. Later when the girls learn that they do not have a food refuge and will have to marry their cousins, it is my own who suggests they should take control of the situation themselves and kill their husbands on their wedding night. Fiona takes on the role that historically has been linked to Daniel's their father. While the wedding night ensues and witnesses a, a, a number of playful and almost loving acts that one would expect from a wedding celebration, 
It soon descends into aggressive behaviour and violent outbursts from both the male and female sides of the wedding party. For example, Viona stabs Constantine with a knife, which prompts the start of the slaughter. While the bloody murders take place, Lydia and Nikos are unaware they have separated from the group, and in comparison to the barbaric acts, they are tenderly making love outside the stage, as you can see in the photo. When it is discovered that Lydia has not killed Nikos, Viona calls for a trial. She believes her sister has committed the ultimate act of betrayal by breaking her oath. Bella and old Rachel Arthur offers to play the role of the judge in the trial, taking on the supposed role of Aphrodite. Fiona and Lydia both make speeches concerning love, justice, and reason. Bella comes to the verdict that Lydia cannot be condemned because love is the highest law. This expressed the idea behind 544 of the surviving material of these being in play, which, as discussed earlier, is often attributed to Aphrodite. The play ends on the celebration of Lydia and Nicholas' marriage. There are a number of differences in Mee's version of the story, when viewed alongside the surviving elements of Mee's trilogy of Pericrates and Denets, <coughs> we can see sorry, uh, there are a number of differences. Big Love investigates the human psychology behind what takes place and provides a forum for the characters in depth to discuss their responses and themes of the play. Differing from Pericrates' interpretation of hosting all 50 brides and grooms on stage, me opts to focus only on three of them. The three women each represent a gender stereotype. Lydia and her betrayal, betrayal Nicholas, our Pied National and Lysinius, are seen as thoughtful, grounded people, aware of the severity of the situation and want to work towards resolution. Lydia and Nikos provide greater insight into the type of relationship their ancient counterparts may have had if given the chance to develop before the murders. The reason behind her sparing him is because of their mutual love for one another. We witness this romance develop throughout production. Nicole Nikos declares his love for her, being admired her from afar, and chooses to woo Lydia rather than force her into marriage. While Dennis is absent from the Mead's play, some facets of his character and reactions are absorbed into the girls' personalities, in particular for Iona. Dennis's paternal voice and reasoning are filtered and manifest themselves as a strong feminist stance, reflecting the desire that Dennis holds in other versions that the girls should not marry their cousins. Iona is the Dennis figure, and is the one who suggests that their only escape is through the murder of their potential husbands, and actively encourages the girls to follow through with the act. The debate on this is then brought into the productions. Perperetti uh, believes that Dan the Danids and Darius are punished by the gods for their atrocities. No trial takes place by Pagnesha, but she is spared the hell of the other, which the other girls have been put through. This is in contrast to Big Love, which includes a trial scene in a nod to one of the many hypothesized versions of the play. Viona protests that Lydia is in the wrong and insists that justice needs to be served. Once again, she assumes the role we managed to imagine Danny is adopted towards Hypermesha, claiming Lydia is the one who tried to, who it should be tried for going against her family. So, when we look at all this, uh, what we draw away from it. If Hypermesha was the character in the East Versus play, should the audience see her as a brave individual standing up for what she believes is right, like Antigone, or as a disobedient daughter or sister? Ultimately, what is Aeschylus wanted his audience to walk away with, surely he, would have, surely he wouldn't have agreed with, uh, with the murder of bridegrooms. So does he want to prove that such behaviour will be punished? If so, what form did it take? Now, using these versions of the story can be problematic when trying to ascertain the plots of the trilogy. The accounts we have been considering were composed for new and different audiences and consumers and therefore may differ significantly from Aeschylus' version. Despite this, there does seem to be a similar structure of events, so educated suggestions of how Hypermesha appears in Aeschylus can be made. I believe we would meet Hypermesha in the final way. The wedding celebrations would come to pass in the opening of the dance, with the death of the bridegrooms having taken off stage, um, perhaps during the prologue. Once the murdered husbands um, have been revealed, Hypermesha's betrayal of orders, whether her father's or her sister's, would be discovered, prompting anger within the group. She would be held accountable for her actions, and perhaps this is where Fragment 44, the speech of Aphrodite, would have appeared. 
The rest of the plot remains purely speculative. However, I believe once the atrocities were revealed, Danny's would have then escorted his confined daughter, Agnesha, into the scene. He would announce her betrayal and aim to have her put on trial on the basis of disrespecting her family. During the trial, Aphrodite would appear, dispelling any charges against Agnesha and explain that the Danids were innocent as they were motivated by their father. Lysias reappears from hiding and Aphrodite tells him to let the girls live and purify them from the pollution of the murders so that they can marry again in the future. Perhaps a similar procession to that fin which finished the supplements would take place. But instead of communicating a sense of foreboding, it would be seen as a joyous wedding procession, uh, with Hypermesha being celebrated for her commitment to her husband. So while Hypermesha was displaced out of Eastwood's production due to the fragmentary nature that the text arrives in, I hope I've demonstrated that she perhaps did exist in Eastwood's creation, particularly when we consider her involvement in other versions of the movie.